Hello, future respiratory therapist. A couple of questions for you I'm going to answer here real quick. I hope everybody's off to a great week. Um, it's Tuesday, October 29th, I believe. Maybe 28th. I don't even know what day it is. Yeah, October 29th. Tuesday, October 29th. We're going to get this out. No telling when you're going to see it or if you're going to see it. But I'm going to answer some questions today. I hope everybody's uh, recovered from Respiratory Care Week and looking forward to Halloween. So we got an exciting week here. We're also getting close to November, which means we're getting close to the Thanksgiving break and then into the end of the semester. So I know, I know students are excited right now. You're also very, very tired, as are your faculty members, your professors, your clinical instructors. They're tired also. We're tired also. So, so it's time for a break and we're getting there, okay? But you have to push through to the end. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of encouragement. I like to think of marathon runners. If you watch a mar- if you watch, nobody watches marathons, right? No. But if you've ever been at a finish line supporting somebody you love, you see that at the end of the marathon, end of the run, these people dig deeper and push hard, harder. And that's why I like to tell students towards the end of the semester, you can't get lazy and let your grades start slacking and your study time and your prep start slacking. This is when you have to dig deep and actually put forth more effort. Okay, so just a little bit of words of encouragement for you there. Now, I do want to answer two questions. I'm going to answer two of them because I can answer them relatively quickly. Probably going to be a fairly short video. Uh, The first one comes from New RRT88. This is the second time you've asked the question, and I appreciate that. So the question is, do you wait the full two minutes when you hyperoxygenate somebody because a respiratory therapist told you that it doesn't really matter? So my answer to this is, is that I can... I can empathize with the therapist who told you that it doesn't really matter. Now, the educator in me wants to say you oxygenate and you wait the full 120 seconds, the full two minutes before you suction. But I'm going to find a middle ground here and say this kind of depends on your patient. I'm going to speak from a personal approach to respiratory therapy the way I practice, which which is where I like to think a lot of my teaching comes from is what I teach is what I do. And so... For me, I'm going to give you two different scenarios. If I have a patient on, let's just say, PIPA 5 and 30% or 35 or 40% FiO2, and their saturations are 99%, I'm probably going to go in, I'm going to assess my patient, I'm going to recognize the need for suctioning. Once I see that the patient needs to be suctioned, I'm probably going to hit the 100% button and probably kill about 30 seconds. So I'm going to get my suction catheter out. I'm going to move it out to the bedside. I'm going to explain to the patient what I'm about to do. It takes, you know, 20 to 30 seconds to do that. Maybe wait another 10. Now we're 30 to 40 seconds, maybe 45 seconds into the hyperoxygenation period. Now remember, they were 99% when we started. So... If you're on 30 to 40 percent and your sats are 99 percent, your PaO2 is not in a concerning range. Remember, a sat of 90 percent is a PaO2 of 60, approximately. So 99 percent, you know your oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. 99 percent, your you, you, your PaO2 is more than likely greater than 80, maybe even upwards to 100 or 100 plus. So you don't really know, but you know your oxygenation status is good. So I'm probably not going to wait the the full two minutes on this patient. Probably going to wait 30 to 45 seconds after I oxygenate, suction the patient, see what I get, let the two minutes finish out. Sats are probably going to hold at 99 or 100 the whole time and watch my heart rate. Everything's going to be good. Not a problem, right? So in that situation, the answer is no, I'm probably not waiting the full two minutes. Now, if I take another situation... Take somebody on a PEEP of 15 and an FIO2 of 60% and a SAT of 91%. Now, we understand that this patient is already mildly hypoxemic because the SAT of 91% puts us at a PAO2 of around 60, a little higher than 60, maybe 61, 62, roughly. So you already have a mildly hypoxemic patient. Now, when we know, when we suction somebody, especially somebody who is already compromised from an oxygenation standpoint, then it would make sense to hyperoxygenate this patient to the fullest. 
I'm going to hit the 100% button, and I'm going to watch their stats rise up, and I'm probably going to give them the full two minutes of 100% um, FIL2 while before I suction. So you'll see their stats go up. Hopefully their stats go up. And then I'm going to suction. And then after I suction, I'm probably going to hyperoxygenate again. So to answer your question, not always do I wait two full minutes. But definitely if I have a patient who is who is showing impairment to oxygenation issues, a diffusion issue where we're struggling to oxygenate, I'm definitely going to hyperoxygenate that patient for the full two minutes, wait it out. And then after I suction, I'm going to, I'm going to hyperoxygenate again post suctioning because I don't want to, I don't want to get behind the curve. The last thing I want to do is suction somebody and their stats fall to 87 or 86. And now I'm looking at it going, well, crap. Do I go up to 70%? I don't want to deal with that problem. It's just better just to, to be proactive instead of reactive. And so that's my take on the hyperoxygenating prior to suctioning for the full two minutes. Okay. Now, the other question comes from um, um, Quiz Daham. Now, this is a really good question because this is a thought, this is a, this is a, a question that is, that a lot of students don't grasp. The question is, is if you're set on a respiratory rate of 10, then your total so cycle time equals six. I'm gonna put this on the board. So respiratory rate equals 10, total cycle time equals six seconds. That means that in mechanical ventilation, you're gonna have another breath coming in six seconds. But the question is, is if you're in AC versus SIMV, if the patient triggers a breath at the five second mark, how does that change? How does that change the dynamics? So let's look at it. I'm gonna do AC here. I'm gonna do SIMV here. And I'm just gonna draw a pressure waveform. I could do volume or flow, it doesn't really matter, but I'm just gonna do pressure just to keep it easy, okay? So, so we have marks here, right? So, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So imagine these are ticks, okay? These are, these are seconds. And like the scenario you asked, said a breath starts at the one second mark. Now you have a total, total cycle time of six seconds. So you're gonna have a breath start at the one second mark. So breath goes up, comes out, and it's gonna hold until we get to the seven second mark. Now at the seven second mark, you got another breath coming. Same for SIMV, no patient effort. Breath starts here, comes up, comes down, it's going to hold till seven because we have a six second total cycle time, next breath starts. Now the question is, is what happens if the patient initiates a breath at the five second mark? So here's how it looks different. The five second mark here, they're going to get another breath, and this is, a, this is an, a, a machine breath, so it's going to get another breath. Now, when do they get their next breath? They take another breath at one, and they took one four seconds later at five. Then their next one is coming at 11. Okay? Because, see, the AC, when in AC, the ventilator, as, as high-tech and as smart as it is, it's also kind of dumb. It knows that it gave a breath, and it's not supposed to give another one for six seconds. So not another one until seven seconds. But, oh my gosh, I gave one at five seconds. In its mind, it knows it gave one because the patient asked for one. The patient asked for a breath. It, the patient triggered one, either flow or pressure trigger. So the vent said, okay, you want a breath? Here you go. So it gave a breath. But the vent can't differentiate between this breath and this breath. So the vent says, okay, well, Total cycle time, 10 a minute, so I'm waiting six more seconds. 
So it waits the full six seconds. There's another one coming at 11. If the patient triggered another one at nine, then this keeps getting pushed off. Another one at 15. Okay, that's in AC. Now, in SIMV, you have a breath here, and you got another one coming at seven seconds, right? So you have breath at one and a breath at seven. What if the patient takes a breath at five? Then the patient's gonna take a breath, and they're gonna get a spontaneous breath. And then, two seconds later, the vent will give its mechanical breath. Now, in SIMV, the biggest thing you need to understand is what the S stands for. And the S stands for synchronized, which means if this patient asks for this breath within the window of the next machine breath, then the ventilator might synchronize to that spontaneous effort. This varies based off of algorithms of each ventilator. Um, you know, if, if another breath is coming at seven seconds and the patient asks for one at six or six and a half, it's probably going to be a synchronized breath. But look what happens. The patient took a breath at five and then it got a machine breath at seven. This is different than what happened up here on AC. When we were up here in AC, when we asked for a breath at five, we got pushed off until the next breath at 11. So in other words, SIMV is going to be 1, 7, 13, 19. Just four breaths. Roughly one second, six seconds later, six seconds later, six seconds later. If the patient asks for one inside of this window, then it might be synchronized. But if they ask for one here, it doesn't affect the scheduling of this one. If they ask for a breath here, they get to take true spontaneous breaths and it doesn't change the timing of the next breath. Where up here, if we have one, seven, 13, 19, based off of six seconds total cycle time, when machine breaths are scheduled because they're time Time triggered, right? Which means we're on a time system. Every six seconds. Boom, 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 boom. If the patient asks for one here, then this breath doesn't happen. Let's say this is three. Then the next breath is going to happen at nine. And then from there, the next breath will happen at 15. And the 13 doesn't happen unless the patient asks for one and then we'll be back to 19. So in AC, if the patient's breathing above the vent, understand that the vent is going off of the total, total cycle time at the end of each triggered breath, whether it's time triggered or patient triggered via flow or pressure. If the vent gives a time triggered breath, it's waiting six seconds, six seconds later. Breath at one, next at seven. Oh, patient took one at four, next breath at six. Oh, patient took one at, 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 at 10, next breath at 16. So it's always going off of the last breath that was given, the time cycle, based off of the total cycle. But SIMV is very much more structured. It's going boom, 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 and this will pretty much be standard unless they get slightly ahead. Like if the patient asks for one at six, then this may become synchronized and this may go from 13 to 12. But overall, you're going to stay here, 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 and here for your machine breaths. Everything in the middle is spontaneous breathing altered by pressure support. That's it, guys. That's the answer to your question. Hope this helps. If it doesn't, leave me another comment and say, that didn't help me. Like, I already knew that, and all your scribbles on the board made no sense. And I'll try to do it much cleaner for you and see if I can make it make sense for you. I'm here for one purpose, guys, to help you. To help you have a better grasp on what you're learning in respiratory therapy school so that each of you go out to be better, high-quality respiratory therapists for the be better improvement and care provided to the people of this world multi-levels here okay so please leave me your comments please like this video and if you haven't subscribed yet 
What are you waiting for? Best wishes.